Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a session, as you know, the title is Gathering Storms in Asia and Latin America, Outlook and Policy Challenges. <clears throat> everybody knows we live in a global world, and uh, so you have to cover as much as possible the world in order to understand uh, even individual countries. And this is the motivation for this. Of course, we have a problem out there. Uh, the problem doesn't seem to be going away. <clears throat> it sort of travels from region to region. And, uh, and uh, here we have the opportunity of uh, uh, putting together, comparing, discussing two important regions in the world, Asia and Latin America, which uh, share uh, the same sphere, uh, share the same shocks, and, uh, but they have different, you can call, initial conditions, different characteristics, different history, uh, different politics, etc. So that uh, looking at both and discussing how this uh, shock uh, that we are going through uh, affects them, uh, we believe uh, will help us understand each of the regions and the world as a whole a little better. Uh, this is a dream also that uh, Professor Ito and I have been discussing uh, for some time and, and tried to find ways to uh, make effective to put the two regions together. Everybody talks about the two regions constantly, uh, but it's difficult to find a, a venue where both are being uh, discussed. Uh, in this case, when both are, basing, are facing the same very similar uh, external uh, uh, conditions. And uh, we have two excellent uh, speakers uh, today. Let me just very briefly introduce them. I'm sure uh, the two of them are, are, are well known. Uh, so I will be very brief, really, because I don't want to spend the two hours uh, summarizing their contributions, which are many. Let me start with uh, Professor Ito. <coughs> Takatoshi Ito is a professor in the School of International Public Affairs here, SIPA and Associate Director of Research at the Center for Japanese Economy and Business at Columbia University. Of course, he has taught in many places in the US, but before joining us, uh, he taught at the Hito Tsubashi University and at the Graduate School of Economics at the University of Tokyo. Uh, he has many uh, 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 distinctions uh, among which uh, uh, I mentioned that he was president of the Japanese Economic Association, fellow of the Econometric Society, uh, research associates of uh, the MBR and CEPR, and his research includes uh, capital flows and currency crisis, microstructures of the foreign exchange rates and inflation targeting, and in addition, he got the National Medal of Purple Ribbon uh, in June 2011 for his excellent academic achievement. And of course, I can go on and on. Uh, but I will talk here and then uh, uh, introduce uh, Ernesto Talvi, uh, who is the director of the <coughs> Brookings uh, Global Series Economic and Social Policy in Latin America initiative and academic director of CERES in Montevideo, who is a, one of the most prestigious uh, research institutions in uh, Latin America. And uh, his uh, research focuses on emerging markets, macroeconomics, and uh, once again with a special emphasis on Latin America. And he has, as you could imagine, uh, many papers uh, in those topics, I must say, that he's a visiting professor at Columbia. He has taught in the PPM program, and uh, given that we have PPM students, take a good look at him. He's gonna be your professor at one point during the spring semester. <clears throat> uh, 
So let me, let me, so you can see why I'm, I'm delighted to have <coughs> these two friends uh, joining in today. Uh, they will make um, some uh, short presentation at the beginning, and I hope that this becomes a conversation where both the, the panelists and, uh, and the audience get, uh, get involved. Uh, I'm sure that there are going to be questions from different corners. Uh, let me just say just a few words for introduction, just to sort of warm up. Uh, uh, a warming up exercise, if you wish. Uh, we, we live in a very, very interesting world. I mean, from the point of view of research, I'm very glad that I'm not the policy maker. Uh, but really, uh, uh, the fact is that, uh, uh, as you know, in 1998, we had a very big crisis that uh, cut across all the emerging markets. And the feeling was that if the crisis next time were to start in the USA, that would be the end of, uh, of the world. And for emerging market, it would be just uh, devastating. Well, it didn't happen that way. Actually, in 2007, when the first tremors of the crisis were felt, I mean, I'm talking now about the subprime crisis, uh, and you look at the data from emerging markets, they were totally indifferent. Nothing happened. Uh, and then all of a sudden, that's how the idea of uh, decoupling uh, started to be uh, circulating. Uh, and, uh, but then Lehman changed everything. There was a very big shock, affected very badly all the emerging markets, as you know. Uh, and then some of us said, well, now is the moment of truth. Well, it wasn't that way. Actually, they recovered very quickly just because uh, central banks, like the Fed, etc., as you know very well, started to put in a lot of money into the liquidity, into the system, and it helped more the emerging market than the developed countries. Uh, so uh, after a year or so, the problem was over, over in, in emerging markets. They started to grow. There was a big bonanza period. Uh, until 2013, and then is when we the tremors came back again, uh, just because uh, Bernanke mumbled something in Washington D.C. somewhere, one of those august institutions that everybody keeps an eye on, uh, and uh, and then we had a taper tantrum. Uh, nothing happened, but a lot happened at the same time. So. That's when, then again, uh, the decoupling idea went to sleep, and uh, people started to look at, uh, at the Fed uh, very closely in emerging markets. And uh, now we have evidence that uh, output is slowing down badly, that in America, uh, current accounts are very negative, all kinds of things that are going to be covered by the speakers in much greater detail. But that's why we are, that's why we say, we ask ourselves, it's, it's a good moment to ask, is this just a momentary thing? Uh, is just a fear that will go away quickly after December, maybe when we realize that the rise in interest rates is not a big threat? Or are we really into a new phase where emerging markets are going to be really now going through a, a period of crisis that maybe it's even comparable or even worse than the one we've seen in, in Europe. So that's the motivation that we have. And again, uh, I'd like to, to welcome our, our friends and looking forward for a very productive discussion. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, as uh, Guillermo introduced, uh, storms that uh, which we, we're gonna we will see probably next year, uh, and traps which uh, uh, we will see in next um, uh, decade or two. Uh, so that's where storms and traps uh, come from. So storm is just around the corner, some people think. 
because the U.S. is going to probably, uh, <laughs> probably, uh, hike the uh, interest rate in, in December, right? So that's the market expectations, more, more than uh, major the majority thinks so. Then uh, uh, whenever um, the U.S. hikes the interest rate, some country gets into trouble. 1994, Mexico got in trouble. And um, uh, later in the decades, that uh, Latin America had a problem. Uh, 80s, Latin America had a problem. And towards the end of the 90s um, uh, and the beginning of the 2000s, Latin American countries had a uh, problem. So this time around, when the US is going to raise interest rate, which country may get into trouble? That's the uh, storm question, right? And uh, next year, um, some country gets into trouble and we say, we told you so, <laughs> right? So then I shift uh, uh, to a more medium term question that whether emerging market economies here, the Asia and the Latin American countries, are growing into higher income status as theory predicts. The theory predicts that um, uh, lower income countries grow faster because they can get more capital, labor, and technology easily. And uh, they converge to middle income, converge to high, higher income. This is called growth convergence. And if you take the intermediate macro, you learn this. Uh, 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 and I, I will refresh your memory of this growth convergence theory. Then we're going to fit it with the Asian countries and Latin American countries and see whether this conversion, convergence is happening. And the conclusion is that it's happening to some extent in, in Asia, uh, but um, uh, uh, and, and a few countries in, in Latin America, but, but not necessarily a universal uh, phenomena among the, uh, em uh, the, Latin, uh, the emerging market economies. So then we, we call it uh, middle income trap. This convergence to the higher income country stops in the middle and uh, people are wondering what's going on. And uh, we, we provide several advices, but um, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a trap part, okay? So those are three things I wanna talk about. I, I'll be very quick because um, uh, time is important here. So storm part, right? So um, um, we have seen these uh, capital flows are uh, causing all the troubles for emerging market economies. And when the monetary situation is easy in the US and Europe and Japan, capital moves to emerging market economies and, and their, their growth will be stimulated. And um, uh, you know, the overheating sometimes happens, bubble sometimes happens, and uh, uh, you know, business cycle uh, goes in the phase that in the US, monetary tightening is necessary, then capital reverses the direction and comes back to advanced countries. And that moment when the capital stops coming and actually reverses the direction and coming back to advanced countries, emerging market economies get into trouble, okay? So um, as I mentioned, the U.S. is about to raise interest rate and see whether this is the beginning of a uh, storm uh, uh, somewhere in emerging market economies. And uh, um, adding to that, there is a slowdown of Chinese economy, which we have been uh, uh, hearing about in the last uh, uh, several months. And now the China is the uh, second biggest uh, uh, economies in, in the world that is affecting uh, all the uh, other countries and especially for the commodity exporters and commodity prices collapsing and um, uh, that's hard hit for the commodity exporters um, like Chile okay? and, and Malaysia. So um, uh, this, this is additional factor that probably next year is a very dangerous year. 
So this is a growth forecast by World Bank and um, uh, very short-term uh, forecasts, uh, uh, past and, 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 and future. So from 2013, there's a significant growth uh, decline in Latin America uh, till this year. That's the bottom of the uh, figure. And BRICS, well, a slight uh, decline, uh, which includes China. And um, uh, East Asia and South Asia are doing fine, uh, above, um, above uh, 6%. And especially South Asia's uh, uh, good performance is something, uh, something uh, uh, new. And um, uh, countries like Philippines are actually doing very well in the recent years. So uh, this, this is a near-term thing, and you know, this, this forecast, World Bank forecast, says economy will rebound and, and grow again in 2016, but is it going to be like that? That's the question. Okay. So Asian countries learned a lot in the 1997-98 so-called Asian currency crisis. And um, I can go on for uh, several hours on this topic. But just to say that uh, they, they had a vulnerability in the financial sector, they had a bubble, they had overheating, and when the capital started to move uh, uh, away, they got into trouble. And um, uh, so lessons they learned was that you need a large amount of foreign reserves as a cushion and uh, they call it uh, self-defense, uh, self-insurance. And uh, to keep the banking sector uh, uh, healthy is very important because banking crisis uh, is coupled with uh, uh, currency crisis is a deadly mix. And, um, um, and um, uh, uh, limit external short-term liability. So this is Nowadays, it's called a macro prudence policy, borderline with the capital controls, but Asian countries do believe that those prudential policies are useful. So uh, they, you know, uh, they have been uh, 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 preparing for the next crisis since 1998. And in addition, Asian countries have uh, uh, increased their uh, financial integration, adopted inflation targeting, and uh, promoting uh, FDI uh, and uh, try to create their regional bond market and um, uh, accelerating FDAs. So all those things uh, are um, making their economies uh, uh, stronger. And um, uh, let me start. Uh, so in, when, when the global financial crisis, which Kirodemo uh, mentioned, uh, happened, um, Asia was not uh, that um, uh, severely uh, uh, affected. Actually, uh, the Asian currency, uh, Asian uh, economies, which is atop the red line, was much better than uh, other regions, but especially during the global financial crisis, they were not really affected much. Of course, they were affected, but it didn't go into negative growth in 2009. So Asia was probably learned something from 97, 98, and they're uh, prepared for the crisis in 2008, 2009. Okay. For Asia, the Asian currency crisis is much uh, severe uh, uh, rather than the 2008 crisis. So the, the trough was shallower in global financial crisis. And this is for the uh, Southeast Asian countries. Again, the drop was much uh, more pronounced in 97, 98 than uh, 2009, okay? So Asia learned something and uh, weathered uh, this global financial crisis much better than other regions and much better than their own past. Okay, in the medium term, th this is a, 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 the graph of so-called growth Convergence. You take the uh, per capita income level on the horizontal axis and growth rate in the vertical axis. And there is a negative uh, correlation, uh, which means that low income country can grow faster 
and as you grow faster, you your income becomes higher, then your growth rate becomes lower. Japan had 10% growth rate in the 50s, 60s, 4% in 70s, 80s, and 1%, which is below uh, potential, but uh, 90s and 2000. China was growing at uh, 10% uh, till several years ago, now 7%, probably 5% in, in uh, several years from now, and just following this uh, uh, blue line, Japan and China, typically. Uh, uh, typical, typical example of growth convergence. Now, this is a sort of the growth convergence uh, uh, graph, which is, uh, uh, this is uh, Asian countries, and the three dots are, three dots are the, um, uh, three dots are 85, 96, uh, and 99 to, uh, after Asian crisis and after, uh, uh, after the um, um, global financial crisis. So three periods, average growth rate and average uh, income. And this is, this is a graph. So for China, it's traveling uh, left to right. And first it went up, but now growth rate is much lower. Korea, Singapore, it, it all looks downward sloping curve, which I just explained as growth from versions. So um, if I fit, uh, not rigorous econometrics, but um, um, sort of the hand-drawn econometric uh, um, line that uh, you see two lines actually for the uh, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. So for Malaysia, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, Philippines now converging to this uh, uh, southeast uh, uh, growth path, they have to travel into uh, somehow to the northeast growth uh, convergence path, which is probably innovation, structural policy, uh, and so on. But um, uh, 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 if they stay on the green line, that's a middle income trap. You cannot catch up with the Singapore or Korea. So that's, this is sort of uh, uh, to show two things. One is growth convergence is observed in, in Asia. Two, there seems to be middle income trap in the sense that uh, uh, the growth convergence paths are different. Okay, so Latin America, which I, you know, uh, my uh, uh, two colleagues uh, have much more uh, detailed knowledge, so I, I, um, I do not want to fool myself, but this is South, uh, South, South American uh, growth uh, rates um, and few episodes of uh, uh, crises in some countries punctuates those uh, 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 periods. Um, so this is like a growth convergence path for Latin American countries. I spent 10 minutes trying to make sense out of this graph and I couldn't draw my uh, handwritten uh, uh, convergence line. Chile looks like a you know, good example, uh, like China, that uh, uh, high growth to low growth, low income to um, high income. Um, some countries actually go backwards uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, uh, maybe my colleagues can explain uh, how to read this uh, uh, graph. But I, it's not apparent in South American context, this growth convergence story. Okay, so um, wh whether uh, going forward we can solve this middle, middle income trap and uh, put all the emerging market economies on the, on the high uh, uh, growth convergence path is a question. And I should uh, wrap up because I do not want to take too much time. So summary this, uh, is that yes, the storm next year seems likely, but we do not know which country. Uh, it's, it's not just uh, economic condition, there is a political dimension in, in crisis that political uncertainties and vulnerability is always a uh, 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 important factor. Uh, growth convergence is uh, working at least in, in Asia uh, Latin America, I'm not sure. Uh, my colleagues can teach me. And middle income trap seems to be real. 
and we need to have uh, some uh, policy advices to uh, get over this uh, trap. But this is mid-term mid mid uh, 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 agenda, like uh, next five years, 10 years. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Guillermo, for, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to share the panel with Professor Ito. Um, when, when we really think about all the things that happened in, in, in the last uh, two years, uh, 214, 215, that were not actually in the radar screen, I mean, the annexation of Crimea by Russia, the emergence of ISIS, the immigration crisis in Europe, um, the victory of fringe parties like Syriza in Greece, and the emergence of um, fringe parties in other, to the right and to the left in other parts of Europe, oil prices at $50, um, the meltdown of Petrobras in Brazil, the ninth biggest oil company in the world, I mean, it's amazing how many things we actually didn't anticipate um, that could happen. So I always like to say that this, in some sense, vindicates John Kenneth Galbraith, the Nobel Prize in economics, when he said that the only role of economic forecast is to make astrologers look respectable. So um, we are not going to engage ourselves in economic forecasting today, but in what I like to call economic analysis. And these are two very different animals. Um, uh, basically, economic analysis doesn't try to play the oracle. Basically, what we are trying to, to make sense of a very complex world, uh, to try to make, I mean, in the hope of making more informed and better policy decisions. So what we are going to try to do today is to try to start by the very basic thing. It's put some structure into the facts, which is not an easy thing to do. I mean, I remember a very nice dialogue from the playwright Noel Coward in, 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 in the comedy Blight, Blight Spirit, which if you didn't read, I would recommend that you do so. It's extremely funny and sharp, and there's a dialogue between a medium and then the person that needed her assistance, and uh, she was speechless, and the medium said to her, um, fire away, and she said, well, it's so outmost difficult to explain. So, well, facts first, explanations later. And she said, well, uh, it is the facts that are difficult to explain. So. What we are going to try to make is sense of the facts very quickly, and then we'll leave the explanations, if there are any, for the Q&A session with, with Professor Ito and Guillermo. So um, here it says four, it should, say it should say five, but let us characterize what are the five key features of the post-financial crisis uh, global economic geography. Uh, and the first is that we have anemic growth in the world engines of, of uh, in, the, in the economic wo world en uh, engines, uh, in the world economic engines, sorry, and deflationary pressures. We are seeing this in the U.S. I mean that it's basically uh, achieving um, trend growth or, or uh, historical rates of growth when interest rates are all are at zero. Um, Europe doesn't even make it to its average rates of growth and it's having deflationary pressures. Japan has been having that problem, uh, two problems for many years, and now China is experimenting a very severe slowdown with disinflationary pressures at the level of the consumer price index, but deflationary pressures at the level of the wholesale price index. So this is the first characteristic of the 
of the, the current economic geography. The second is that we have assisted at the end of the price boom. If we measure commodities in real terms deflated by world inflation, then commodity prices are today at the levels of 2004, which is exactly prior to the boom, and this is true for all commodity groups, oil, metals, and foods. And if we believe forecasts, which we shouldn't, uh, according to the IMF, these very low commodity prices are expected to persist in the foreseeable future. The third characteristic of the world uh, economic geography is that uh, we know that U.S. interest rates are going to go up. We have no uncertainty about the direction, but we have a lot of uncertainty about the timing, about the magnitude, and about the speed, which actually do matter quite a lot. And uh, according to what mar markets are expecting, it is, uh, for the time being, a very gradual increase in short term and even more gradual in long term interest rates and a flattening of the yield curve. The fourth characteristic is that partly due to asymmetric QE, quantitative easing, that, I mean, we used to call it when we were in school, printing money uh, to buy some kind of bond or uh, in the market. So, so QE is a, is a, I mean, is a variant of printing money sometimes in, con in contrived ways, but, but, but it, it is that. And uh, the U.S. is in the process of unwinding quantitative easing while the Eurozone and Japan are, on the pro are in the process of doing exactly the opposite, um, fueling quantitative easing. And what we've seen is a very sharp appreciation of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the yen and vis-a-vis -vis the euro. Um, and that's another characteristic. And finally, what we've seen, and uh, the fifth important characteristic that we are seeing, is a reassessment of risk in emerging markets. Uh, first, the spreads that emerging markets have to pay over treasuries have significantly increased. Um, uh, and uh, more than 30% of the emerging market countries have been downgraded by the credit um, rating agencies to the point that today, on average, the typical emerging market economy is below investment grade, while a few, uh, I mean, a year and a half ago, uh, I mean, uh, the typical emerging economy was above investment grade. So uh, the, the consequences of this reassessment of risk has been a large turnaround in capital flows to emerging markets from positive to negative in the financial flows. If you were to add FDI, uh, you would see a very significant decline, but they would not turn negative. But the financial flows, which are the quickest to go, uh, have uh, turned negative very, very quickly. So this is a major change relative to 2004, 2012. I mean, uh, in that period and what Guillermo was suggesting, when the global financial crisis created this excess of whatever you call it, liquidity, uh, saving, but uh, that flooded emerging markets to buy land, to buy property, to buy firms, to initiate new businesses, to buy stock, to buy bonds. So creating an asset boom, a credit boom, a consumer boom, an investment boom, and very high growth rates. Now that process that we've seen in many, many countries throughout the emerging world has, uh, I mean, has gone through a major turnaround. It's going through a major, major turnaround. So let me uh, show you what this is, uh, how this is impacting in Latin America. Uh, and, uh, and it is interesting to see that when people talk about Latin America, the first thing they will tell you, well, these are very different countries. You have to see, well, it's true, but it's also true that, that these countries seem to be uh, dancing at the tune of the same music. So. Um, uh, there's uh, an enormous amount of commitment there and uh, therefore it makes sense in economic terms to talk about Latin America as a region and uh, in fact the reason why we see that enormous commitment 
is that a very limited set of external variables, growth in developed countries, G7 countries, growth in China, commodity prices, and the international financial conditions and which these countries can access both capital and financial resources actually go a long way in explaining uh, economic fluctuations in the region. That black line that you see there is the actual year-on-year -year GDP growth and the line, uh, the dotted line is what the model would have predicted only on the basis of the evolution of these external variables. And actually when you do this out of sample uh, exercise for the current cooling off, you see that if you were to have known the trajectory of the external variables, you could have predicted perfectly the slowdown that we've seen in Latin America in the last two or three years. And that has translated into a very sharp recession in exports. I mean, in part due to the enemy growth in the developed world, but in part to the fact that we are very highly dependent on commodity exports. That has translated into a severe drop in asset prices and to a very severe decline in credit flows and a, an investment recession, an import recession, and an actual recession that we are going to have as a region this year. And to a larger or lesser extent, that has affected all countries in the region simultaneously. They are all growing by less than they did a few years ago. And with the cooling off or recession, depending on the country, we are actually seeing, after a little bit of a long time, uh, the reappearance of the twin, twin deficits. I mean, current account deficits, large current account deficits, coupled with large fiscal deficits. Um, and we are seeing very large currency depreciation, which, as Guillermo was saying uh, yesterday in a conversation we had in a, in a seminar, I mean, this is a, it's new for our, for our region. I mean, we are going through large depreciations up front rather than trying to defend a pre-existing exchange rate and therefore grow, going through a massive devaluation after uh, losing a huge amount of reserves. So this is a new phenomenon, and what we are seeing together with this massive depreciation is... Uh, uh, inflationary pressures trying, trying, starting to build in the economy and actually um, in most countries uh, inflation is going over the upper limits set by the central banks that are pursuing inflation targeting regimes. So in this kind of world what are the key challenges? And I'm going to state and leave for the discussion that I don't think that the key challenges are going to come through uh, the financial channel, the, the key uh, through the financial channel, in the sense that uh, we think that private banks are uh, relatively well positioned to, to really face a turbulent period. The levels of liquidity, as Professor Ito was showing, relative to short term debt are extremely. Uh, strong in Latin America in general, uh, in most cases going well over 100%. So, so there's more than enough reserves there to cover the debts coming due in, in the next year. So we think that in that, if you compare that to 1998, um, Latin America is much stronger in the financial side. So we think that in a sense, we are going back to the kind of problems that we had uh, before, and I'm going to try to respond to Guillermo's question, is Latin America going back to, to, to the kind of, I mean, crisis that we had perhaps in the 80s, or are we going to, this is going to be a temporary blip and then we are going, and, and I'm going to say that the answer is yes and no. And the answer is yes and no because we don't have one Latin America. Let me leave Argentina and Venezuela apart because it's going to appear in the discussion, I can promise you. I mean, and, uh, and these are special cases because they do not have access to international capital markets and that makes them very different from the rest. 
And as you know, Vargas Llosa, the Nobel Prize winner in literature 2010, said, you know, there are developed countries, developing countries, and then there is Argentina. So um, now we could add perhaps Venezuela, but I don't think Venezuela has yet the track record of Argentina in order to make it as a special case, because for Argentina it's been a lot longer than for Venezuela. So what we are seeing here is that the Pacific Alliance countries, which have been had, um, I would say, a much more prudent macroeconomic management and have an outward looking uh, uh, development strategy of integration, um, those countries start this process with very low levels of inflation. And therefore, they can afford the luxury of accommodating the adverse shock that comes from abroad by actually lowering interest rates and allowing inflation to slip up a bit, a little bit. But nobody is going to uh, believe that if you go from two to four, that suddenly you lost the anchor, that you lost credibility. So you are here trying to balance accommodating to an adverse shock from abroad uh, against trying to uh, be credible while you accommodate that adjustment. And these countries can afford doing counter-cyclical monetary policy the way uh, 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 developed countries do. Now, look at Brazil. Brazil is basically on the edge of, of two-digit inflation. And therefore, it cannot afford doing counter-cyclical policy. On the contrary, as you see, it has to raise interest rates in a very significant way to try to prevent uh, inflation from slipping over into a territory that would call into question their commitment and therefore call into question what we think. And we can discuss at this end is a little bit the anchor of the system, not only in economic terms, but I give it a lot of importance. And we know that because we live through many inflationary periods in political economy terms. High inflation countries are very difficult to govern. And you don't even have a budget that you can meaningfully talk about. So we got accustomed to very low levels of inflation. It would be a dramatic change to suddenly go back to where we were 30 years ago. So this is a difference. The other difference is that Brazil starts this recessionary period with higher public debt, with higher deficits than the Pacific Alliance countries. And since it has to increase interest rates, uh, it's adding insult to injury because uh, your primary is deteriorating and you are adding to the interest bill. And therefore, the deterioration in the public finances that you've seen in Brazil is dramatic. You went from 2.5% of GDP to 9% of GDP deficit. And therefore, any exercise, and the numbers can change, the OECD just published a few numbers, and uh, Angel Urria, uh, the director general, I think it's a name, uh, uh, said uh, the arithmetic um, is dramatic. And uh, I just read it yesterday, and uh, it is dramatic. I mean, the adjustments that you would require in order to stop that explosive path of debt would be really dramatic. To my, in my opinion, completely unviable, politically. So, so Brazil is against the ropes. And, we, we, and I think for very traditional reasons, it is on an unsustainable and explosive path of its debt dynamics that would require adjustments that are politically impossible. And therefore, you are either left with the option of using inflation to dilute uh, uh, your commitments, or, and this is my prediction, <laughs> if I'm going to do any, uh, eventually, Brazil will have to go to the IMF and uh, come up with a plan uh, to try to, to, to make sense of, 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 of a gradual and not a draconian adjustment. Um, but it will, it's going to need outside support to do it. I don't think they can do it on their own. Um, on, on convergence, because we didn't uh, 
I mean, uh, coordinate with Professor Ito, but it appears as if we did. Uh, uh, look at Latin America, Professor Ito. I mean, uh, this is a very different story than Asia. I mean, we've been declining relative to the US for 50 years. But suddenly, in the last decade or so, apparently the process of, of divergence stopped and we started the process of convergence. Uh, we call this, is this convergence or is this a mirage? Uh, we call this, in a small essay, we wrote the, the decade of development-less growth. Why? Because this process of income convergence did not come together with other characteristics that are typical of countries that actually did converge. And we actually used many Asian countries to see what happened with these other variables that I'm going to show you during the period in which they were converging, and they were also converging towards developed country levels. So if we look at the sophistication of what countries produce and exports, We've seen no change whatsoever in the sophistication of the production and export bundle. This is not what you see in true processes of development. Uh, if you look at the traditional drivers of growth, uh, trade integration, quality of public services, physical and technological infrastructure, human capital, innovation, I mean, you see basically no convergence in any of these um, drivers uh, at the same time in which income was actually converging. So essentially the conclusion that you have to, 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 to get to is that actually convergence was an artifact of, circumstantial, of, of circumstances that were very fortuitous. I mean, you had these very high commodity prices, very low cost of capital and financial resources, so if what you produce now is worth more, and the uh, capital and the financial resources I use as an input to produce them are very cheap, uh, then my income goes up, but my ability to generate income actually is not very different than what it was. So um, this is not, and, I'm, and this is, I'm going to finalize with this. So I don't think we are on a convergence path. The only country that, that is actually in Latin America, it's in a convergent path, is Chile. And this started long ago uh, in 1985, but it is taking, uh, if you were to project current potential rates of growth of Chile at about 5%, you would predict that it would take 50 years to Chile to converge to about 66% of the level of the US, which is about the time that it took for Korea and Hong Kong to, to do the same. So, so Chile is, in, I think, on the, on the verge of, of, of achieving things. So, and just to conclude, Latin America, the global environment has changed very significantly, and, and for the worse. Uh, so Latin America is confronting very significant economic challenges, very important for countries like Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, and I think much less so uh, for the Pacific Alliance countries that I think might navigate through this uh, with relative uh, ease, although not without pain. Um, so you have also development challenges, and that's true for all. Uh, and at a time in which, because of economic malaise and the frustration of a an emerging and still fragile middle class, uh, you've seen a popularity and approval ratings of, of popularity of presidents and approval ratings of governments plummet very significantly in every country. So this is, this is a tremendous challenge because uh, you need to be able to govern effectively to address these challenges at a time in which politicians and incumbent presidents are becoming highly unpopular. So we make also this distinction between countries in which, like Chile, for example, in which the president lost popularity and approval and has very low approval ratings, but nonetheless manages to govern. Uh, 
with respect to countries like Brazil, where Vilma lost popularity and the government approval ratings, and also because of the Petrobras scandal, basically, that has paralyzed the ability to decide and to govern. So Brazil, it is as if uh, we are entering into the operating room for major surgery, and suddenly we are left without the surgeon. So that, those are the main messages that I would like to share with you before we go into the discussion. Okay. Well, thank you very much for two very <coughs> insightful and comprehensive uh, despite of the little time that uh, you had uh, presentations um, and um, so I was trying to to react <coughs> in some <coughs> general way to, to the presentations. Uh, the presentations, uh, they give you differences of urgency. I mean, listening to Taka, you realize that there are problems, that there are challenges, but we kind of have time ahead of us. Uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, the, the region has, as he put it, learned the lessons of the Asian crisis of 97 and did a couple of things that they did not or had not done uh, uh, prior to the 1997 uh, crisis, uh, one of which was uh, accumulating uh, international reserves. I guess the feeling was before the crisis that for some countries like Korea, that they have graduated and they have become like, like the U.S., where you don't look at your international reserves because you have a reserve currency. And they found out that uh, without that, they had to depend on the fund, and the advice of the fund was not very advisable. <laughs> uh, so having learned that lesson, they, uh, they accumulated very energetically <coughs> international reserves. The other thing that they have changed was that prior to the crisis, they pegged their currencies. Now they don't. They follow inflation targeting and some kind of dirty floating. But in any case, they move away from the kinds of relatively rigid exchange rates. And having that, that uh, when you look at the region as a whole, uh, you see the shock of the Lehman crisis, but in a relatively muted way. And, uh, and, and now, of course, there are concerns, one of which, I don't know if you elaborated on that, but I'd like your opinion. I mean, there is the, the slowdown in China. Sometimes I feel that Latin America perhaps is more vulnerable to, to, uh, to, to, to the shocks from the capital market, given its history. Uh, given the inflationary problem that they, they still have, uh, but uh, those problems have been overcome in, in, in Asia, but still there is the fact that Asia is now very closely linked through trade with, with uh, China. And I wonder to what extent that could be a shock. And I'm not talking about uh, just simply thinking about what's going on now, but the, the concern that some people have, and I think there is a good reason for, for being concerned about that, is that China is running a financial system that is highly vulnerable, and it could very well come to a stop. Uh, and I'm not sure how the central authorities will be able to deal with that. They have a lot of money, and what I hear all the time is that, look, don't worry, because they have lots of international reserves. But that's not good enough as we know from the European experience. It's not good enough to be able to bail out the financial system. 
you have to make sure that the financial system continues lending. So it's a, cl it's a flow problem. So how, how to implement the flow problem, how to solve the flow problem, we know that Europe has been hit by that, and they had a big problem with that, and they still do. Uh, so I, I wonder how the, the Chinese authorities would be able to, to keep on pushing that flow in the right direction, because they have done that. I mean, the, the, the flow is very large, actually, and the stock of debt in China is very, very large uh, already, and that's where the problems come. So if they have a problem of that sort, and they had to keep on pushing the credit channel, I don't know how they will do it. That's why my, my concern that they could be I in a bind which might uh, result in a even sharper uh, stoppage of, uh, of growth. But so th that would be my main uh, uh, re uh, question for you, uh, Daka. Uh, on Latin America, well, uh, obviously, uh, when you compare, I don't know if I'm right, if you guys agree with me, but uh, what jumps up at you is uh, Asia has, in the first place, a much higher savings rate. That's an issue that, that didn't come up. But uh, I think that's a fact that we as economists don't know very well how to handle. Because we see the correlations, <laughs> uh, but if you ask me how do I get the savings to go up in Latin America, which is very low, it's very hard to, we still have, there is no silver bullet. Nobody knows a very simple answer as far as I can tell. So that's a state of nature, kind of. Uh, so, so Latin America is for having, in order to achieve a reasonable rate of growth, highly dependent on, on foreign funding. And at the same time, for some reason, uh, the regions doesn't seem to be able to even have its uh, fiscal accounts in, in order. And consequently, for example, in the recent episode, the one that uh, 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 Enrique uh, Ernesto Talvi was uh, uh, showing us, even, even during that period, this bonanza period, uh, uh, you look at the fiscal accounts and you realize that the, the government has spent the whole bonanza bonus to the point that now, when the situation is kind of unraveling, they are forced to make a big adjustment on, on, that, on, that, on that end. So, so not only the, the, the private sector does not uh, save enough, but also the public sector. Uh, so, in comparing these two regions, then, I come out with the feeling that uh, to which I'm not very sympathetic which, but I had to admit that that's what comes up with comparing the two, is that the, the standard, the old-fashioned fundamentals uh, of, you know, saving enough and and the investing enough and, 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 and technical progress, those sort of things are there. And uh, in the end, that will dominate. And maybe what we are seeing in Asia is that they have, uh, they made some mistakes in the past, they can correct those mistakes and then start traveling uh, in a much safer fashion. Whereas Latin America, as uh, Ernesto showed, uh, it's going sort of back to the 80s or the 90s, we don't know. Uh, and, but with the authorities, governments are still very weak. I don't know, sorry for taking so much time, but uh, the presentations, I felt that I had to sort of at least react. This is fascinating. I see both are facing the same shock, and here we are seeing uh, a different picture emerging from, from both. The, the picture that emerges, especially when you look at Brazil, which is so central to Latin America, is really worrisome. He talked about 9-10% of, uh, of fiscal deficit. Well, the primary is very close to zero. You know? So the, the 9 percentage points that you see there is the interest rate. 
uh, on, on government debt, even though government debt is small, right? What is the share of government debt in, in Brazil? 60 hmm? percent, 60 some plus percent of GDP. But the interest rates go through the roof and, and it's now increasing. So it is the interest rate that is killing them. So there you have the minister making terrible efforts to, you know, save one percentage points of the primary, and that has tremendous political repercussions, while the interest rate is just going up and up and up. And there is no, you cannot stop that unless you can stop expectations. And with a president that has lost uh, uh, reputation, uh, that's very difficult. Nobody's in charge. So that obviously the two regions, from that point of view, are very, very different. But once again, I have the feeling that Asia did the, the homework that Latin America is still uh, uh, lagging behind. So I would like to give you guys another chance if you want to react to what each other said or what I said, and then we open up to. Okay, so Guillermo asked uh, specifically the China question. And um, as I mentioned briefly, that the Chinese growth rate has been declining. And uh, also there, there's a question about, um, about the official statistics, that whether, whether currently uh, stated 6.8% growth rate is um, actually true. So but we, we, we don't know, so we cannot say for sure. But the um, real activities in uh, electricity consumption, freight uh, transportation, uh, industrial productions, they're all pointing like zero to 2% growth. So um, if, if the service sector is tremendously in increasing, maybe 6.8 as an average is, uh, is fine, but uh, many, many people doubt that uh, uh, official statistics and um, uh, truth is that slowing down is much faster than, uh, state in, than the stated numbers. So um, uh, how, how that will affect the Chinese economy, financial sector, and the um, outside world spillovers to uh, other countries? So uh, Guillermo, you mentioned the financial sector, and we, we, ha we, we know that um, uh, there are problems in the uh, local government uh, financed um, infrastructure projects and we call a platform. So there is a shadow banking which is uh, sort of financed by local government and private sector and selling the high yielding certificate to the retail customers getting money, put the leverage in and in investing real estates. And um, uh, many people have been uh, warning that uh, this may, uh, this, this is creating the uh, so-called ghost town that nobody's living in the, um, uh, in the uh, condominiums. Again, we don't know how serious they are. We have the anecdotes, cases here and there. But uh, if that is uh, more serious than we, 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 we tend to believe, then uh, there is a there is a huge problem down the, down the road, and uh, they they had sort of the non-performing loans problems in the past with especially with uh, state-owned enterprises uh, SOEs, but they did sort of the bailing out SOEs and and bailing out uh, state-owned banks which financed um, uh, SOEs. Um, but this time, you know, they're saying that you know, no, no more bailing out, and um, uh, whether that is will be promises kept or again uh, another bailing out, and whether that again then that's a good thing or bad thing that that should be uh, debated. So they have money, uh, no question about it. That, but um, uh, wh whether they use it wisely again is a is a, a, a big question. So. Uh, slow growth and uh, financial vulnerability that has a lot of similarity to the Asian problems back in 97, 98. But I don't think that you know, China will experience the severe crisis. Uh, they may have a mild crisis, but they, they have money. They can get over it. Good. 
Um, Tak, I would like uh, just to leave a question on the, on the, and then I'll answer okay. immediately, but just so that I don't forget. When you showed the, the lines, uh, convergence lines, okay. you were saying that Southeast Asia would not be converging. Uh, right. to lines Singapore and Korea, mm -hmm. but those growth rates are, would still be much higher than the U.S. and Europe, so they would be converging at those rates towards right. the... Yeah, com convention is there, whether that, that is uh, the, uh, speedy enough, that's the question. Okay. Um, let me react to what Guillermo said. I think that it is interesting that, that, that it is a more nuanced view that you can really have of Latin America these days, in the sense that um, it is true that Brazil, the major country, and Argentina and Venezuela, these are the major countries in the region, are in different kind of trouble, but in trouble nonetheless. But I mean, there are these uh, Pacific Alliance countries where you see very strong banking systems, very strong levels of liquidity, international liquidity relative to short-term debt, where you see an outward orientation uh, of development. I mean, basically, the Pacific Alliance is one of the most uh, modern and avant-garde kind of agreements that you see today in the world. Uh, so, so I would say that that gives a positive note to the region. Then on the other extreme, you have um, Argentina and even more to the extreme, Venezuela, which actually, since they, in Argentina, I think it's a very nice case because Argentina had a tremendous boom between 2004 and 2012. I mean, at, with the commodity boom, in spite of the fact that Argentina was completely closed to, um, uh, uh, excluded from international capital markets. So Argentina did not get the windfall of capital inflows as other countries did. It only got the windfall of China growth and high commodity prices. So would it have gotten the windfall of, of, of capital prices? I think Argentina would have grown the highest in the world. I mean, it grew at 6% even in spite of the fact that capital was flowing out nor into the country during that period. And then uh, when, the, when the external environment, uh, the global environment deteriorated, Argentina entered into a period of, of a very severe slowdown and, 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 and the recession. It basically grew at, at, at zero in the last four or five years. Uh, and then it, it had a, the, 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 the fiscal surplus that it had became a, a large deficit since they had no access to credit. They had to finance that by printing money. And, uh, and uh, therefore with high inflation. So really, Argentina is a case study of a deteriorating situation which creates a fiscal problem that without the access to credit forces you into inflationary finance and in order to protect your level of reserves to capital controls and exchange rate controls. Uh, Brazil is an intermediate case because I think Brazil shares with the Pacific Alliance countries the fact that it, ha it has pretty sound banking, uh, a banking system, uh, private banks. Uh, it has pretty high levels of liquidity, so that is a change with respect to the previous crisis, but unfortunately, uh, this fiscal situation is... is, is but, but by the way, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Brazilian banks, they have uh, public debt in their asset side. How can you say that they are strong? Well, uh, Michael wants to say something, but I'm... I'm yeah, no, no, I will give uh, everybody a chance in a moment. 
Okay, so somebody who will it for later. When you look at, basically, when you look at uh, the capital and the provisions that banks have already made for the possibility of um, lo some loans turning sour, um, um, they are really, really the non-performing loans would have to go through the roof to be able to, 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 to start biting into the depositors pockets. I mean, really, they have a very, very large capital and provision base uh, that they can tap on even, even if they are fa faced with some uh, bump on the road. Okay. Well, I think now it's uh, time to open uh, up a question from the floor. And I gather that you, Mike, must be uh, jump. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I, I agree with everything that Ernesto said, but I think you're too easy on, in particular, Brazil, and way too optimistic, way too optimistic about, about Brazil. I think that um, to say that it's a different story than Argentina, in some ways, of course, it is, but it reminds me of the joke that people used to tell about Brazil in 1998, which was, what's the difference between Brazil and and Russia. This was after the Russia default, and the market punchline was six months. And I think really, <laughs> Brazil and Argentina are in the in the way that you described it. Um, uh, six months, eighteen months. I don't know, but it's a matter of time, really, before Brazil goes uh, the direction of Argentine inflation. There's really no other. There's no other way for them to go. The fiscal adjustment is completely off the table. So there's nothing but fiscal dominance hey, facing monetary policy for years, right? For years. We're not talking about, oh, okay, we have to stagger through an election that's six months off. Because if Dilma's impeached, we have at least as much political disorder as we have now. So we have years during which there's no hope of establishing a, um, a monetary anchor because the fiscal prerequisites for a monetary anchor are, are simply not in place. I agree with you that the private banks are unlikely to go to go broke, um, but it kind of doesn't matter, right? It's certainly not going to prevent an inflation to have solvent private banks, especially since the private banks have been marginalized by the government and kind of pushed to the side by these monsters, the, the, the public banks, especially the BNDS. So basically we are in agreement, Mike. Because well, no, because you think I, that... I yeah. think that Brazil is against the ropes. Yeah. I think that this dynamic is explosive. I think that the adjustment is infeasible. And I said that there are two ways out. Either you are going to inflate away the problem or, or a combination but of inflation and inflation, or either you would have to go to the IMF yeah. and get a big package that will allow you to get money at much cheaper rates than you are getting today. So to I, had, to I had my tongue I mean? partly in cheek when I said that, I was, that you were too optimistic, because I know you don't feel optimistic about Brazil. <laughs> but another way, thing I wanted to um, take issue with was the idea that one of the paths is to inflate away the problem. You can't. You can't inflate away the problem in Brazil because virtually every expenditure that they have is protected, indexed by law, in many cases, as you know, by the Constitution. The public debt can't be inflated away because of the 65% of GDP worth of public liabilities, the vast majority are either linked to the CPI or another price index, linked to the overnight policy rate or some other interest rate, almost predominantly the overnight policy rate or um, dollars, which is not much, but still there's some. And the tiny little bit that is actually fixed rate, BRL denominated debt, almost all matures in the next year or two. The dirty little secret is that while there is some long duration nominal debt that you could in principle inflate away, only 6% of GDP worth of the government's liabilities are both fixed rate, um, and maturing beyond the end of 2017. So you can't inflate away the problem. So um, we're, we're in essential agreement, except the fact that I think this could explode much more quickly than, um, than uh, many people kind of seem <coughs> to think is plausible, plausible now. So, eesh. 
Could I go? Last point, last point. I take your point too, and I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm reacting to what you say, not disagreeing with it, huh? but I think it's worth putting the external context in perspective. We have, for Latin America and for Brazil, on Brazilian government data, a terms of trade that's the same as it was in 2004. Your numbers agree, huh? We have world financial conditions that are extravagantly, extravagantly permissive for debtor economies like uh, Latin America, even after 100 basis points of tightening that we sort of expect to see by the end of next year, the US interest rate, the only econo large economy in the world where we see interest rates going up, will have a policy rate that's sort of like 100 and, well, roughly 100 basis points below the core rate of inflation. Huh? So even by the end of 2016, never mind now, we have radically, wild-eyed, crazily um, permissive um, financial conditions, and yet Brazil's where it is, right? So I, I absolutely take your point, and you know I agree with you, that we have to account for the global factors, and your numbers show that they're significant, but the magnitude of the mismanagement of the 2004-2009 boom, especially in Brazil, it's mind-boggling. I mean, who would have believed in 2005 that something like this could happen in the 21st century after Brazil has been through the 200 years it had been through. Sad, huh? Sad. But I, sorry, if I get let, let me add. Yeah. Let me add one point. Do you want to react immediately to that? But just one, one thing that maybe the two of you may want to uh, take uh, into account. Uh, I'm also very, ne well, of course, it was clear from what I said, rather negative about uh, Brazil. And uh, especially the fact that the fiscal deficit is now driven very much by interest rates. Right? The poor Levy, the, the <coughs> Minister of Finance, is trying to you know, struggle for getting half a point here, half a point there, while the interest rate can wipe out everything that he's uh, trying to do. But uh, when I mentioned this to, uh, to one of our colleagues that are fortunately visitors, is not uh, around today, uh, Andre Lara Resende. His, uh, his reaction is, well, but uh, be careful here because there's been a very large devaluation. I don't know, it depends. It, it, one year, uh, in the last year or so, I don't know, you know the numbers better, very large. Uh, he says, and now the country is not, not all the, uh, not all the uh, debt is indexed, and that uh, represented a big capital gain for the government. It turns out that we don't count that in our fiscal accounts. But if we did, uh, probably the deficit, the actual deficit, would not look so bad. I don't know. I, uh, I know. I, I know. I, I'm sorry. The, the accounting oddity, I mean, it's kind of odd that Brazil has a public debt of 65% of GDP and measured interest payments of 9.5% of GDP when a lot of their debt um, uh, pays less than the 15% Selic, or the even Selic is less than 15%. And the reason it is that, as um, you were told, the domestic dollar-linked debt, they count the depreciation as an interest cost, but they don't count the capital gains on form, not on the foreign issued dollar debt, but the domestically issued BRL payable dollar linked debt, they count that capital gain to the investor, capital loss to the government as, as interest. But they don't symmetrically count the capital gain on the international reserves as interest income. So that 9.5% of GDP budget deficit that you see and the interest rates that go along with it is is kind of an exaggeration. The real number is you have a primary deficit of about one and a quarter percent of GDP in 2014. This was not such a bad year. Things just started getting bad in 2014. So 2015, 2016, cyclically speaking, taking the year as a whole will be much worse. And you probably need three to four percent of GDP primary surplus. So the magnitude of the adjustment is, as um, that's required is on the order of 5% of GDP if they do it now. Of course, if they wait for three years, which is almost inevitable, it'll be even, even, even bigger. Huh? So. Great, so. And Mike, one question. Um, um, do you think, um, we agree we are on a collision course. Uh, 
Um, Brazil is a systemically relevant country. Uh, so do you believe, um, as I do, that Brazil is going to go the way of trying to gather the support of the international community to try to process what, I mean, the closest to a um, orderly adjustment uh, of this uh, of this quagmire in which we are. You you need to go there, right? <laughs> I I feel uncomfortable because I should be asking you the same the same <laughs> question. But, but I already I, answered. No, what, yes. Yeah, what I think is it has to get worse before it gets better, and it has to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I don't think that this government will be the one that goes to the IMF. I think you really need to see. At we least do not have three years, no? Pardon me? We do yeah. not have uh, three years it's I mean, to it assist. Can, it could be ugly, right? Three years, is, it passes pretty quickly, right? Think about Argentina, how long Argentina has been in this, in this fiasco. Ten years, Venezuela, as bad. We think three years, it you know, can't last that long. Believe me, I think it can, easy, huh? So, however, however, if you see enough inflation early enough, then maybe you have a new government that can go to the IMF. This isn't really a problem that IMF money, IMF money is required to help with because they have $360 billion of international reserves. They have the dollars. As Guillermo said, it's a flow problem and it's a fiscal problem. And the IMF doesn't have enough money to backstop the um, Brazilian budget budget deficit, I don't, th or financing requirements, let's put it that way. They can come in and probably will have to come in to, um, to kind of raise confidence and try to help the, and to monitor the program and so forth, but it isn't a, it isn't a st sudden stop issue, um, as Guillermo, I think, agrees, right? It's a flow problem, it's not a stock problem, it's not a capital flight problem, it's an unsustainable budget problem. And uh, so until they can resolve that, and you have to get pensioners willing to say, okay, um, Maybe I can't retire at the age of 57, um, or maybe um, I can't have my 13 pension payment every every year, or whatever it is they have to do to re reduce this grotesque pension. But I think we're very far from from a consensus around the need for those policies now in in Brazil, and I don't think we'll get there until it really hurts in in, in Brazil. I think. Look what they're talking about doing now. They're talking about bringing Mendes in to replace Levy and start pumping up credit. Are they crazy? Are they crazy? But that's what's in the newspapers now. So that just shows you how even the economically literate kind of chatter chattering classes are kind of talking about the problem in in Brazil now. It's uh, it's uh, so yes and no, right? Like you said. Ben Newman. Sure. Um, I don't want to try not to continue this point too much, but to me, the my question is is more of a timing question, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, uh, Ernesto or, or Michael or, or anyone else, you know, on how long can Brazil continue down this path? Because what worries me is that because of the size of the reserves and because of the composition of Brazil's debt, it, we're not on the brink, and so rather than this being a six-month issue. To me, the, the negative scenario, but the one that concerns me, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, is that Brazil can actually maintain a, a, a steady de deterioration for two or three years. And, uh, and unlike 1998, unlike some of these other episodes, they're not forced to respond. But I'd love your thoughts on sort of how, how, how you envision the, the, the path of Brazil heading towards um, uh, you know, a lender of last resort. Okay, are you discounted the uh, discounting <coughs> a currency run, a run on the currency? Well, no. I mean, I, I think that. I mean, I think that's the uh, because they have the resources. Is there is no run on the currency? Right, right. No, I think right. that is. I think that would. Be, uh, if they start spending the resources, right, they can trigger the run on the currency. Right. But but there, I think you you. I mean. Some people have suggested you can't discount some kind of um, some kind of forms of uh, of capital controls, mm. and uh, which which is and so to me that the puzzle for Brazil is are we about to head in the direction of 
capital controls or are we bringing back, you know, Enrique Mareles, which to me are very different, um, are very, very different paths. And they're talking about bringing him back in January, oh. which is <laughs> the infinite future for Brazil. I mean, to the last uh, assertion, there's no central bank savior here because the problem uh, is, as we were saying, and we all agree at this point, a flow problem, flow fiscal problem, uh, and that explosive debt dynamics that cannot reasonably be stopped in any uh, meaningful period of time. So I think, but uh, uh, let's see what Guillermo might have to say. But the I way I like to think free to this, it's very difficult to pinpoint the timing of things. Uh, the beauty of Krugman's model, I mean, which is, uh, I think, one of the most beautiful, I mean, the fact that, that you are on an inconsistent path all along, losing for the yeah. students, that's the Krugman 1979, Krugman right? 1979. No, not, not Krugman 2015. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a totally different Krugman. <laughs> it's uh, the academic uh, Krugman, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, uh, it was interesting because uh, his model was about a country that had a fixed exchange rate, had a fiscal deficit, was printing money to finance the fiscal deficit and losing reserves all along. So we knew this was a chronicle of a death for toad. I mean, because uh, I mean, at some point you would run out of reserves, so you would think intuitively that look, if I know this is an abolition course, I'm going to run today to the exits. Well, no. I mean, things get deteriorating and gradually deteriorating, deteriorating, and then you hit a threshold, which in the Krugman uh, beautiful model you can identify precisely in which you have a run. Now, that day specifically nothing specific, nothing strange happens. It's not that you're going to see a headline in the newspaper uh, saying, look, I mean, you are going to see a run uh, that we know exactly that would come at a certain point T. So it's, we know there will be a point T, we just don't know when that threshold is going to be hit because we are not in the model, we are in the real world. And there's a lot of things that you can do, even short of capital controls, uh, to try to survive. I mean, I think that one of the key aspects is when Brazil starts to lose access to the credit markets. And uh, uh, I mean, spreads in Brazil have jumped to the Argentinian levels uh, right now. So. What they did in the past is they started shortening the debt to a point in which they eventually issued 24-hour debt at the selling rate. So it's very difficult to pinpoint uh, timing, but uh, I think we are on a, on a Krugman kind of path, uh, even though we are not seeing it and it's not being expressed in a loss of reserves. Um, well, exchange rate is uh, uh, floating, so it's different from Krugman's model. But it's a, it's a spiral of the depreciation and inflation and it going, going up to the point that probably inflation rate is too high to maintain the ordinary uh, economic activities. That that be a breaking uh, This point, is so. my take. Uh, it's not that different conceptually from Krugman. Essentially, you have... You have uh, the reserves, uh, and uh, those reserves are covering short-term debt obligations. If you were to use them to to avoid the depreciation, then you would be exposed to a run. So what they are doing uh, to try to, although we had a large depreciation, <coughs> is taking the interest rates to the roof, I mean, in order to, to contain further depreciation. So in a sense, uh, we are so the obligations that you are generating uh, in terms of reserves are growing fast. So exactly. if you make reserves net of government debt, which is growing so fast, yeah. uh, it's, it's shrinking. This so it's another way of losing reserves without mm -hmm. losing a cent. Exactly. 
this year is the and at one point they probably had to stop devaluing otherwise they lose control mm -hmm. of inflation and when they try to do that then they go back a hundred percent into a group man model right that's what you have in mind Panma, please i'm afraid I have two questions. Um, how does the monetary policy management of the Federal Reserve affect emerging market economy, uh, balance of payments, and so on? I raised this question before. One of the governors of the Federal Reserve was speaking in the city, and I said, you know, when the Federal Reserve raises the interest rate here, as it is likely to do in Decem December, the short-term interest rate, uh, cash tends to flow in the United States from emerging market economies, creating balance of payment difficulties for emerging market economies. So he looked at me and he said, Professor, do you know the mandate of the Federal Reserve? I said, yes. Uh, he said, the mandate of the Federal Reserve is to uh, manage United States uh, uh, GDP growth rate, employment, and stable inflation. Uh, we are not concerned, he was saying, but he didn't say that explicitly, with the fortunes and fates of emerging market economies uh, through our monetary policy. They have to manage it themselves. So that is one lesson for the Latin American countries. My second question for the, uh, the Earlier, 1997-1998 financial crisis in Asia, about which I have written, uh, and the likely crisis probably in Brazil and other Latin American countries, all the uh, Asian economies, excluding Thailand perhaps, but Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, their budgets were in balance, their current accounts were very strong, their inflation rates were very low, and their growth rates growing at 5% GDP per annum. And yet they got into trouble because of the double mismatch, which one of you mentioned. Uh, double mismatch meaning uh, their banks and corporations in these economies borrowed short term and lent long term. They borrowed, that is the second mismatch, they borrowed in hard currency and they lent in soft currency at home. Uh, so when the debt repayment problems came up, there were problems. How would you uh, sort of compare, contrast the situation with some Latin American countries today, Brazil, for instance? So, so let, let me, let me uh, elaborate <coughs> on the monetary policy. So the official stance of FRB is that as much as that uh, the, uh, the U.S. monetary policy affects the rest of the world, which affects back the United States, that, that is in the model. So they, it, it is not true that U.S. monetary policy doesn't care oh, yeah. what, what, what happens outside the world. But you cannot say that you... you he doesn't think so. No, no that's, okay. it's the same thing. But the, um, uh, you, you cannot say that uh, to maintain the uh, employment in other countries, we hold off the interest rate high. That's not, that's, that's not in the mandate. But in the mandate is that those indirect effects coming back to the US, that is, that is being considered. Okay? So that's why it was you know, global uh, environment is important in, in the decision making of the monetary policy. But you know, even all the saying is that you know, U.S. dollar is our currency and your problem. Mm -hmm. That's the old old uh, yeah. phrase. <laughs> okay. So the second one is that Asian crisis in '97, '98. Um, what you said was 95% um, correct, and 5% five, 5 wrong was that they had current account deficits, huge deficits. Island. Thailand and also Indonesia. So um, uh, the capital inflows were more than offset, offsetting current account deficits. That's why the foreign reserves are rising, which masked uh, the fundamental problems. But other things you, you said was totally uh, correct, and I, I don't 
know much about uh, what's going on in Brazil right now and the double mismatch and, and um, other things. So um, uh, that, that you have to complement. What, what is, uh, is there a... I don't think that's a large, large problem okay. in Brazil today. So, so it's, it's more like a traditional, very traditional, yeah, like a 60s, 70s uh, fiscal crisis rather than 21st century. Well, the, the less traditional problem. aspect of it, as, as Mike was saying, is that, uh, that the, the portion of the debt, I thought it was around, Mike, but maybe my, my numbers are wrong, around 30% of the debt was in, in nominal reals at fixed rates. So. So that would be the dilutable part of the debt. But I think that the difference with the 60s and the 70s is that essentially that you were able to use inflation as a, as a way out of the problem, if, if you can call that a way out. But mm -hmm. the, and today, given the indexation, I mean, the fact that, that, that people learn to protect themselves against mm -hmm. these uh, expropriations, uh, I mean, you are left with a very tiny uh, or, a, or a much smaller part in which you can play and fool around. So you have to do some explicit kind of default or get somebody who, of whom you can borrow cheap, much cheaper. And that is somebody that will give you cheaper rates, but can tell you and will tell you what you have to do. That's exactly what the Troika did with Greece. I'm going to uh, uh, increase the maturity profit of your debt. I'm going to give you very concessional rates, but I'm going to tell you what you have to do. Uh, and unfortunately, when you put yourself in a position that you are in a, I mean, against, uh, in a, as you say, uh, in a, between a rock and a hard place, uh, you put yourself in a position in which you have to go and ask others to help you out, and those others will only help you out if they can tell you what to do. And I think unless Brazil, and this is something it's up for grabs, we don't know, wants to go the way of Argentina. And I think Brazil and Argentina are politically, institutionally, very different countries. Brazil is going through a political crisis because a huge scandal of corruption, Brazil is not going through an institutional crisis. On the contrary. The independent judiciary is putting in jail very powerful politicians, is putting in jail very powerful CEOs. The independent press actually uncovered the problem to begin with. That to me is an institutionally strong country because a corrupt country, you not only let corruption go rampant, Whenever it is discovered, it has no consequences whatsoever for the, for the people who were engaged in corruption. A country that uncovers corruption, even if it's big, and punishes corruption, it's not a corrupt country to me. I don't define that as a corrupt country. But so You still need to fix the policy. Let me say it's this. So we have a political problem, a political paralysis, at a time in which we need major surgery, and unless Brazil wants to go the Argentinian way, i.e. capital controls, inflationary finance of the deficit, if, if it can manage, because that you can always manage. I mean, uh, revenue from the inflation tax. You might not be able to dilute obligations, but you can always obtain revenue from inflation tax. If Brazil wants to go that way, it might, uh, given that I think of Brazil as a very different uh, as having a very different institutional setup, I don't discard the possibility that Brazil is going to go the Troika way, and the Troika way is going to the IMF. And uh, if that's going to solve the problem or not, I'm not sure, but at least there is a chance that you might get some uh, adjustment, combination of graduate adjustment and promises of doing this future adjustment on Social Security, and you can bridge the gap with financing by the international community at reasonable rates that would not break your back. I mean, with with a, an interest rate that would be usual. so. I want to believe maybe that Brazil is going to go that way and not the Argentinian way, which is basically essentially doing away with institutions. 
We still have a little bit of time. So I'd like to hear some comments from the students. You have to come here and expose yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, on the, on the back of the question about the Fed, uh, this time around they they don't they are not managing an inflation problem, so they can kind of pace better, uh, considering financial conditions to hike. So, do you think that this draws a better scenario for emerging countries to adjust, or markets would only simply anticipate all the movement and the flow would go all the countries, emerging countries? So you're saying that U.S. will not raise interest rates so fast, although there may yeah, be they, they right. can be more reactive to financial conditions. So they they are not facing any problems with inflation for now. So no, yet, yeah, yeah. So the pace may pace may not be as fast as the uh, '94, '96 episode. That it'll be more gradual. That's that's good bet. I think that Guillermo uh, allows me, I mean, I think that Guillermo should answer this question because he has a, a beautiful, <laughs> not really, Guillermo, you have a beautiful, I mean, your idea of liquidity, that these emerging market instruments were, were I mean, were, giving, were given liquidity status uh, because Blah, blah, blah. I mean, and I don't want to, to get into the explanation. And, and that implies that even rather small increases in, in interest rates can actually create big movements. So, so I think it's, I don't know, I think it's worth that you, you, you... Well, this is close to high treason. Uh, uh, but I, I take your question. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, one is surprised by the sense looking at the history in Latin America, how sensitive capital flows can be to slight changes in interest rates. And uh, we, we actually tested that with Carmen Reinhardt and Leo Lederman years ago, a paper that came out in 1993. Uh, and we saw that there was a very big impact from interest rates in the US and capital flows into the region. And when we wrote that paper, and we published it, paper, people criticized us because the interest rate was not a long-term interest rate, but a short term. So they said, look, capital flows have to be, I mean, in the standard model, uh, if uh, uh, investment goes to, uh, to Latin America, you would have, uh, uh, the long-term interest rate is, I mean, the 10-year, bond rate uh, perhaps would be more relevant than, than the three months uh, uh, treasury bill. Uh, but it, that depends, that is true if you think of interest rates as, as uh, capital flows are being motivated mostly for uh, looking at the long run. But uh, in, a, in a world where the interest rate on liquid asset is really <coughs> practically equal to zero. I mean, everybody's talking about the search for yield uh, on, on liquid assets. So the moment that the interest rates in the US, which is a very, the paradigmatic uh, liquid asset in, in, in our world, uh, uh, the interest rate on that goes up or threatens to go up, that could have a very large impact. And we've seen some of that already in the taper tantrum in the mid-2013. Uh, Just a movement uh, of hands in, uh, in at the Fed without really implementing any change of policy. I think the interest rate is going to be, my impression is that it's going to be much more, um, have a, a much bigger impact than the taper, tapering. tapering. Because in my mind, the tapering, what, what does the tapering mean? That you are changing the composition of, uh, of the US liabilities. But when interest rates are very close to zero, 
doing that is like changing a $20 bill for two $10 bills. So that's why I was never really very concerned about the tapering itself. But when you raise the interest rate, now that's a price. Uh, you are making the treasury bills more attractive. And my, <coughs> my hunch, oh, of course I have this, there's no science behind this, uh, my hunch is that the interest rate is not going to be affected. If, if inflation starts to uh, kick up now, and they raise interest rate by 25 basis points, that's not going to make a difference. So they will keep doing it for a while. And once the market sees that, then panic will set in. I hope <laughs> I'm wrong, but uh, that's why even though uh, I mean the comment we just heard, I agree with, the situation is very different. They don't have, you are not, you know, you, we are not back in uh, 1981. That I agree. But remember that the tequila episode happened in 1994, when interest rates went up quite sharply for the time, about three percentage points. But, uh, but nothing compared to the Volcker's experiment. So, and despite of that, it had a very large impact in, in Latin America. So, yeah, I'm concerned about that episode. We have to see. Very good. Well, we are living about two minutes. I was thinking that it's like when you drink wine, it's elegant to leave a little bit on the, on the cup. <laughs> so here we are, living two minutes. And i like to ask my colleagues for a really, very lively conversation. and. I hope, uh, Taka, that we continue organizing these kinds of things sure. because it's really very, very, um, uh, very useful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Taka.